When drag racing a stick car, at the starting line, you just put the engine on the limiter and dump the clutch. The clutch either holds or it doesn't, right? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So stick around and we'll learn a little bit about drag racing clutch science. Science! Welcome back to the laboratory. For a lot of people, they think of the clutch as a simple on and off switch connecting the engine to the rest of the drive line. But what happens between the on and off states is critically important for us drag racers. We want the clutch to not only transmit all of the engine torque to the rest of the drive line when it's in the on state, but we also want to manage the rate of torque application as we engage the clutch. Maybe this is a good time for some fundamental physics. To the whiteboard. Classic frictional physics has the friction force F proportional to the normal force N and the friction coefficient between the two surfaces mu. This is the Greek letter mu. Such that the friction force equals the friction coefficient times the normal force. Now this is for just linear sliding friction. For clutches, our friction force needs to be rotational, and what we're interested in is generating torque from the friction force. But to get there from here, we need to do some calculus, and I'm not going to bore you with that. For now, for simplicity, we're just going to say that the torque is equal to the friction coefficient, again, times the clamping force that we've got on our clutch, uh, times a constant z, and yes, that's how you pronounce that letter uh, properly. And this is a constant that accounts for the geometric effects that we get when we do the calculus that I'm not going to bore you with. So we can simply see now that to increase the torque capacity of our clutch, we can either increase the clamping force or we can increase the friction coefficient. Um, we can also do stuff with the geometry. If we go to a bigger diameter clutch, for example, that's going to increase the torque capacity uh, too. But for a given diameter, for a given clutch, we can either increase the clamping force or increase the frictional coefficient. Here's a typical torque versus RPM curve for an engine. Now what happens if we don't have enough clutch torque capacity? In other words, the engine torque applied to the clutch is greater than the torque capacity the clutch can generate from its friction coefficient and its clamping force. The clutch will then slip and engine RPM will increase since the clutch can't generate enough torque to hold the engine back. So to understand clutch capacity, we need to understand friction coefficients and clamping forces. Different clutch linings will have different friction coefficients. For street use, you typically don't want a coefficient that's too aggressive. So you have smooth clutch engagement and no clutch chattering. For racing, we can tolerate some chattering, so higher friction coefficients are typically used. But the thing about friction coefficients is they typically change with temperature, and most clutch linings will lose coefficient with increasing temperature. Now let's go back to the problem of not having enough clutch capacity for a minute. If the clutch slips, engine speed is going to increase, so you'd think that we'd eventually get to an RPM where the engine torque is down far enough that the clutch is going to hold again. But it's not quite that simple. When the clutch is slipping, all that lost power has to go somewhere, See the first law of thermodynamics. So that lost power goes into heat. That heat then makes a bad situation worse if the clutch is already under capacity and now it loses friction coefficient from heating up. There is a solution though. We'll get to that in a few minutes. First, let's talk about clamping force. Clamping force comes from two sources. Static spring force, side ran, spring pressure isn't pressure, it's force. And secondly, centrifugal force is developed by the release levers. The static force comes from coil springs, or in the case of a diaphragm clutch, the single Belleville spring, which is kind of like a big conical washer. The amount of force we get is dependent on the spring rate, the number of springs we've got in the clutch, this one's got six, and how far we compress the spring. The static force doesn't, well, it shouldn't, change with RPM. Centrifugal force comes from the mass and geometry of the levers. As you spin the clutch, centrifugal force wants to send the levers out radially. Since they're attached to the pressure plate, they can't fly out, but since their center of mass isn't exactly at their pivot location, they want to rotate. And they want to rotate in an opposite direction as to disengage the clutch. 
In other words, they try to further engage the clutch, thereby creating additional clamping force. This additional clamping force is dependent on the mass of the levers and where the mass is on the levers. We refer to this as the counterweight. The square of the RPM also comes into the equation too, as we'll show in a minute. So in other words, if you double the RPM, you're going to get four times the centrifugal force for the same amount of counterweight. Now let's see how this all comes together graphically. Back to our typical torque versus RPM curve for an engine. Let's add in our clutch capacity from static spring force. Notice that it's not enough. Okay, the clutch would slip once the engine torque exceeds this point. But what if we add some centrifugal force like this? Now the total clutch capacity is the sum of the centrifugal and static. And you can see now it exceeds the torque output of the engine at all RPM. So the slipping problem is gone, right? Well, let's think about our drag racing problem at launch again. At the starting line, our vehicle's got zero speed. Thus the drive wheels, axles, drive shaft, transmission innards, and the clutch disc have zero speed. But the engine is at whatever launch RPM we're choosing. If we dump the clutch at this point, only three things can happen. Scenario one is the clutch completely locks up and the engine RPM drops or bogs since we're connecting something that's spinning the engine to something that's not spinning the rest of the drive line. Worst case, the engine RPM goes to zero and dies completely. Of course, this would require tremendous traction to happen, but it can and does happen. And it breaks things like anything between the clutch and the drive tires. And you just lost the race, by the way. Scenario two is the clutch again locks up completely and driveline speed quickly matches engine speed. So the wheels spin madly until the vehicle speed eventually catches up to the speed that the wheels are spinning. But if you're not familiar with drag racing, while it looks cool to do big, long, smoky burnouts the whole track, it's definitely not the quickest way to the finish line. Scenario number three. The clutch doesn't immediately lock up, but it slips for a while. As it's slipping, the engine RPM isn't dropping excessively, and the driveline speed can catch up to avoid spinning the drive tires. Once the driveline speed catches up to the engine speed, we can lock the clutch up completely. In an ideal world, the engine RPM doesn't drop at all, and driveline speed increases just as quickly as available traction allows. In other words, we're feeding the exact amount of torque to the drive tires as available traction allows, and the result is the quickest acceleration possible. Guess which of those three scenarios we want? Yeah, the last one. So how do we slip the clutch the exact right amount. Well, we adjust the friction coefficient and the clamping forces, static and centrifugal. Now, remember how I said most clutch friction materials lose friction coefficient as they heat up? Well, one material doesn't, sintered iron. In fact, it does the opposite. As it heats up, the friction coefficient increases. How convenient is that? If we could start with a clutch setup that's under capacity, it'll start slipping and once it starts slipping, the clutch gets hotter and it's going to get grabbier, technical term, with the heat created from the slipping. Now there's a whole bunch of downsides to sintered iron discs too, so keep in mind they're not always the best solution, especially for a streetcar. So once we've chosen a disc material, then we need a clutch that allows adjustment for the clamping forces, both static and centrifugal clamping forces. The most popular of those is the long style adjustable from either Ram or McLeod. I've got both. I've got a Ram in the GTO and I've got a McLeod in the Mustang. And the Mustang clutch is the one we're going over in this video. Why? Because I lost the handle on it as far as clamping force goes. And with too much clamping force, we broke the transmission. You might have seen that as a previous video. 
First step is to measure the installed height of the coil springs. Then we can determine the static clamp load. Typically, we measure the pressure plate cover height from the pressure ring, and that's what this extra hole here is for. We use that measurement to, first of all, monitor for disc wear. As the disc wears, it gets thinner and the cover height gets bigger. We can compensate for disc wear by installing shims between the pressure plate cover and the flywheel and remove shims as the disc wears to maintain that same cover height. Secondly, we use this measurement to determine what the static spring preload is, and that measurement is important for what we're doing today. So, first off, let's get a measurement of the installed cover height. And it looks like we're at 1.931, uh, so we're going to call that 1.93 and run with that. Now, let's get the clutch out in the part and we can remeasure the cover height to get the free length of the springs. Now that we've got the clutch out of the car and all the static spring adjusters have been backed all the way off, we'll get into more detail on those things in a minute. And the three stands have been loosened off. We can go back and remeasure the cover height and see how much initial spring compression we had when it was installed in the car. So using our same checking hole, we can measure the depth now uh, 2.18 is what we get. So when it was installed in the car, it was at 1.93, so that gives us an initial spring compression of 0.25 or a quarter inch. Now, if we knew the spring rate, we could calculate our base static spring force before adding any additional static force by turning the adjusters. But we don't know the spring rate. But we can remove the springs, and using a valve spring tester, we can easily figure that out. So let's go do that. So here we have one of the springs and my valve spring tester. We've measured the free length of the spring, and now we're going to compress the spring, that same quarter inch base uh, installed amount, and see how much force we get. So we've set the valve spring height mic so we know exactly where to stop. So we'll crank this down until we hit the height mic, and it looks like we're at about 100 pounds. So the spring rate is simply that force divided by that compression distance. So 100 divided by a quarter inch gives us 400 pounds per inch. Now we checked all six springs and they're all within about 10 pounds of each other. So our total base static load is that 100 pounds times the six springs. So 600 pounds of base static load in that clutch. Doesn't sound like much, but we've got a pretty aggressive friction coefficient on the disc we're using, so we should be good. Now let's look at how the static adjusters work. This little hat sits between the top of the spring and the pressure plate cover with this screw up against the cover. So as you back off of the screw, it compresses the spring further and creates more static force. The thread on these screws is a 3 8 16 UNC, which means it has 16 threads per inch. So each complete turn compresses the spring 1 16th of an inch, or 0 0.0625. That 16th of an inch times our spring rate of 400 pounds per inch means we get an additional 25 pounds of spring force for every complete turn of the adjuster. Since we've got six adjusters in total, the total static spring force increases by 150 pounds for every complete turn of all six adjusters. And by the way, you always want to have all of the adjusters set the same or bad things will happen. Now, on the centrifugal force side, if you know the exact geometry of the levers, you can calculate how much additional clamping force is developed by the centrifugal force of the counterweight when the clutch spins. The outward centrifugal force that we develop from our counterweights is simply that counterweight mass times the radius that they're out at times the angular velocity squared. This is in radians per second, by the way, not RPM. That outward force is turned into additional clamping force when it tries to rotate the levers in the opposite direction of disengagement. It ends up pushing down on the pressure plate. If we know the geometry of the levers, we can calculate the centrifugal clamping force. So if we know the static clamping force and additional centrifugal clamping force, and we know the friction coefficient, we can calculate the clutch capacity versus RPM curve and compare it to the engine dyno torque curve versus RPM so that our clutch slips initially and then locks up at whatever RPM we want it to lock up at. Believe me, as an engineer, I want to calculate all this, but the problem is we don't know exactly what the friction coefficient is and how it changes with temperature. So we have to try our best guess to start and then adjust as necessary. So my best guess at a starting counterweight is...
Okay, so I picked a counterweight amount for my Mustang as an educated guess. I keep detailed records in my logbook, so I have some pretty good historical data on how much static force I needed without any counterweight in the Mustang. But now with some counterweight, I'm not exactly sure how much I can reduce the static force. But that's where test and tune comes in, and that will likely be in a future video, after we outfit my new race pack data logger in the Mustang, so we can log engine and driveline RPMs, calculate clutch slip, and make clutch adjustments as necessary to get the desired slip. So. There you go. Now you know a bit about clutches and, specifically, about drag race clutch setups. Hopefully you learned something. As usual, I appreciate corrections and feedback, so don't be shy about commenting. So thanks for watching. See you on the next one. And remember, be kind and be humble. Like and subscribe. New videos every Glorious Day. Here's a typical torque versus RPM curve. Here's a typical torque versus RPM curve for an engine. Now, what happens if we don't have enough clutch torque capacity? In other words, the torque the engine reset. And secondly, centrifugal forces that are developed by the. You know, I rehearse this and it goes perfect. Turn on the cameras and everything goes sideways.